Hey guys, welcome back to Embers and Ash. My name's Ashley, if you didn't know, and today is episode two of the Motherhood in Progress series. Today we are talking about screen time, which I thought was gonna be kind of cut and dry, but there's a lot more to it that I had no idea about. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you guys some of the stuff I learned. If you're new to this series, it's only episode two. Um, it's just an open conversation with no answers. I think that there's a lot of benefit to talking about issues and struggles in parenthood. I think that we can learn a lot from a conversation as opposed to always being told how things are because sometimes they're not cut and dry. I got my microphone here that's not plugged in. I got my coffee. Um, this is a very laid back style video. What else do I need to say? This video is going to be a little bit different compared to the last because I did actually do some research. Um, I just felt like last video, because I wanted to keep it so casual, I didn't include research and a lot of the conversation was left out because of that. So this will be including my experiences, your guys' experiences, and what the research field has to say. Um, just a little bit about that. So let's get started. Screen time. So let's start with what are people saying? I did some polls and questions on Instagram and from my relatively small community on Instagram, 60% of you guys said that you use screen time and 40% said that you don't, which I thought was uh, off. Like I thought more people used screen time, but good job to the 40% who don't. Maybe you're lying. I don't know, maybe it's just too small of a scale. Probably is that. <laughs> and when I asked what you guys use screen time for, there was a lot of the same answers. It's used as a tool, as background noise, educational, during lockdown to survive, special exceptions like travel, restaurants, diaper changes, eating your meal in peace. <laughs> it was also often used because parents just need a break and for family time, so like movie nights. I'm really glad that I'm adding research to this episode specifically because the conversation kind of ended there. Everyone kind of has the same mindset. We use screen time, we try and limit it, and these are the reasons why. I asked specifically the people who do use screen time if they try and limit it, and sure enough, 90% of you guys try and limit it, which makes sense. My personal opinion on screen time, I've shared this before, and that is that I didn't want to shelter my child so much that when they do get exposed to screen time in the future, they go nuts over it. I kind of had that experience a little bit as a child where we only had certain channels and once we got more channels on the TV, I was binging that every day after school. So I was thinking, oh well if I expose my child early to screen time, they'll be less obsessed with it in the future, hopefully. Um, and also my mindset is I'm a stay-at-home mom. I would like to have something on in the background to listen to while I go about my day because I'm just hanging out with a now toddler and it would be nice to hear some adult conversation. So that's been my mindset on it. It has changed a little bit since, as we'll get into. And a lot of you clearly think the same. So why do we try and limit it? A lot of people know the common negative effects. I'll go through them quickly. The American Pediatric Society and Canadian Pediatric Society, say that 10 times fast, all suggest no screen time before 18 months, excluding FaceTiming, which I thought was really cool because especially through the pandemic, that's the only way we've been able to communicate with others. And that's also just what modern life is right now, getting to video call family and friends. And I personally don't see anything wrong with that for your children. And then they say, after two years, limiting screen time to an hour a day. Most of us know this, I think. <laughs> and then a lot of the side effects or the reasons why we limit are also common knowledge. I'll go through those quickly. Side effects can include trouble sleeping from the blue light, increased obesity from less activities and less sleep, and overstimulation. So that's what we know. Um, that's what 
we're told even as adults why screen time is bad for us. But now I wanna get into some of the bigger issues and the things that we really need to start thinking about more, or at least I am. Okay, attention span and aggression. These, uh, I guess they're not really that unknown, but there's a bit more to it than I at least knew. For one, before the age of three, every hour of screen time increases aggression by 10%. That's crazy, that scares me. It's just scary seeing like real numbers associated with it. And I'll get more into that later, but moving on with these points, children are less capable when we put the burden on ourselves of keeping them entertained. And this makes sense to me. Like if you have a child that you're always entertaining, they can't fend for themselves. I've heard before that it's really good for children to be bored because that's what sparks creativity. And if every time they're bored, you put a screen in front of them, they're not learning how to figure that out and thinking for themselves. And also just thinking about it, it seems like it takes away from a child learning to become their own person because they're not trying avenues to entertain themselves. Like, should I paint? No, I don't like painting. Should I build blocks? No, I don't like blocks. Should I play an instrument? Yes, I like instruments and then start building off that. These are just my thoughts right here, but it makes sense to me. And then of course, another point that I think we all know is that children will build up tolerances to these shows and crave more and more need more stimulation, more colors, more sounds, um, because they kind of get numb to it, which it's just scary to think about that at such a young age. And that does tie into what I was saying though, of I don't want my child to um, be obsessive over TV, so I want them to get a little numb to it now, which sounds really bad in that context. I'm also gonna try and stay neutral in this, but I don't know if it's gonna happen. Last time I tried to stay neutral and I didn't and the comments got heated, so I'm excited for this time. <laughs> and then the last thing I just wanted to touch on, tying it all together, is just the importance of independent play. Children need to be able to play by themselves for your own sanity, specifically, is what I'm getting at. Like, if I had to play with Rook, every hour of every day, I would go nuts. I couldn't get anything done. I wouldn't even be able to cook meals for him, right? So they need to be able to live a little bit independently. <laughs> okay, that was the least brutal of the following issues. Moving on, let's talk about your screen time. This is something that has blown me out of the water. The first point, this one didn't blow me out of the water, but <laughs> you are modeling a behavior to your child. Every time you pick up your phone, your child sees that and thinks that's something I'm gonna do in the future when I have a phone or whatever. Or just that you're prioritizing time on your phone more than other things that should matter more in your life. I am really bad at being on my phone and you know, a lot of us are, so I don't feel that guilty about it. But I can just go throughout the day and not even like acknowledge how much I'm on my phone. And then when I really think about it, I'm like, I had so many hours in the day. Why did I spend so much of it scrolling? Like, you know that it's not good for you, but you still do it. And you're showing your child that that's the way you should be living your life. And that's a whole issue in itself, how addictive technology is to adults. Um, I won't get too much into that, but moving forward with your effect on your children. Of course, more time on your phone means less time with your children. Even if you are trying to be intentional about time playing with your child, how often are you getting interrupted? And this is a huge point. There's actually an article by The Atlantic. I will put that up on the screen and link it in the description. And it's talking about continuous partial attention. This is just like a concept that humans use all the time. And there's good and bad times to use it. Like when you're driving a car, you're really only putting partial attention into that because you're also maybe talking to your passenger. But there's certain times when it's not good, like playing or interacting with your child. This term was coined by Linda Stone, and I'll read a bit of the article for you guys. Yet for all the talk about children's screen time, surprisingly little attention is paid to screen use by parents themselves, who now suffer from what the technology expert Linda Stone more than 20 years ago called 
continuous partial attention. This condition is harming not just us, as Stone has argued, it is harming our children. The new parental interaction style can interrupt an ancient emotional cueing system whose hallmark is responsive communication, the basis of most human learning. We are in uncharted territory. That's very wordy, and it took me um, looking into other kind of views on this to understand the concept better. And what I found is that when you're giving continuous partial attention to your child, it goes against their human instinct to learn, in a sense. Children's development is relational. They need the back and forth from their parent to be able to make connections. As in, I say something, you say something you go blah blah, I say tell me more, that kind of idea. And instead we're getting a lot of this one foot in, one foot out parenting just because, you know, we're sitting on the ground playing with our child and then our phone goes off and we send off a message and then we continue playing. And it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it actually makes a huge impact on a child's development and there's been studies done showing exactly this. So there's a study done in Philadelphia by Hirsch and Temple's Jessa Reed, uh, they tested the impact of parental cell phone use on children's language learning. 38 mothers with their two-year-olds were brought into a room. The mothers were then told that they would need to teach their children two new words and were given a phone so that investigators could contact them from another room. When the mothers were interrupted by a call, the children did not learn the word, but otherwise they did. Are you kidding me? Like it's that cut and dry. It doesn't make a lot of sense to my brain because if I'm talking with someone and they pick up their phone, it's not like it affects my understanding of their conversation, but clearly children need that unbroken attention to make connections. Like it's ingrained in just their brains. So that in itself has given me a lot to think about and pushed me to put my phone away when I'm having intentional time with Rook. Couple other points I just wanted to add in there. It's a little flavoring on top to make it worse. <laughs> um, just about the parent and child relationship with phones is that tuned out parents, so the one foot in, one foot out kind of parent are quicker to anger it makes sense because you're not involved and maybe you're overstimulated because you're doing too many things at once and then you get set off. And then the other thing was when the parent puts TV on as background, which is what I'm doing, um, it's shown that it's still overstimulating even if your kid isn't watching. Like Rook never watches when I put something on because it's not like a fun cartoon, uh, but he's still seeing the colors out of the corner of his eye, he's still getting all the noise, and they're still being affected by it. And that causes those issues that I already talked about with sleep and obesity um, and overstimulation, even if the child isn't directly watching TV. Love that. Okay, so that wasn't great. Um, moving on <laughs> to the next point that sucks. And that is all about educational children shows. A lot of people talk about their reasoning for screen time being it's educational, but it turns out that each hour of educational TV is associated with six to eight less words learned. And this has been blowing my mind. <laughs> a lot of this section I got from the podcast Femstrong. I will link the episode in the description. It is so good. It's like over an hour long, sit down, relax, and feel bad about yourself. <laughs> so why don't children learn from TV shows that are supposed to be educational? Well, one of the biggest reasons is that it's a one-sided conversation. Like I've said previously, children need that back and forth to learn, and a character on a screen talking to them doesn't make that connection for them and so they can't learn anything from it. Again, they need that face-to-face, -face, they need that serve and return relationship. And then on to older children who know words or like understanding what's being said on the TV. This is something that really got me. Um, TV shows that are trying to teach a lesson or a moral actually cause children to be more aggressive. <laughs> and this is because a child can't learn the moral of a story until after the age of eight. So that means when they're watching a show and a kid is misbehaving and then a little while later they show 
oh, you shouldn't have misbehaved because of this. And it all seems like a perfect bow on top, beautiful. The child can only see it as scenes or only interpret it as scenes. So they see a character being aggressive and then a character being good later, but they see it as completely separate. So they take in this character misbehaving and then model after it because children are sponges and they just like to model whatever they see in the world. So they see someone being aggressive on the TV and then they themselves are aggressive. Blowing my mind. <laughs> and I've heard this from other people too, other moms with older kids saying like, yeah, I would show my child this Disney movie, but then they started acting bratty like the character instead of learning to value friendship or whatever the story's trying to teach them. And now it all makes sense sadly. And then on top of that, these companies that are making these shows are doing so to make money. No surprise. And to make money, the shows have to hold your child's attention long enough that they watch it and enjoy it and want more of it, right? And to do so, they have to make these shows way too much for your child to handle. Loud noises, quick scenes, bold colors, all the things that keep your child's attention glued to the screen but are horrible for them. This again plays into the overstimulation and all the other bad side effects because these companies are banking on your children to be obsessed. It's a sad reality. Okay. Let's move on. What does all this mean? Are we supposed to just never watch screens again? No, <laughs> that's not real life. I just wanna tie this up with some real life perspective and what I'm getting as a potentially good approach to this. But I did also ask you guys on Instagram why you use screen time and 80% of you said because you needed a break. And I think that is the most valid thing I could ever hear. <laughs> Sometimes parents just need a break and screens provide such a great tool to offer a parent a break. Like parenting is hard and not to mention that there's so much more social pressure to be doing everything for everyone at all times. Like if you are just a stay at home mom, it is kind of frowned upon. Like you should have your own side gig or more hobbies or more than just a mom, more than just a dad. And that pressure means that we need more time in the day. And we're not gonna get that time in the day unless sometimes we give our kids iPads. And that's kind of the reality of things if you're choosing to go that path of being everything to everyone. So I think there's a lot of validity in just needing a break, not to mention like, sure, we can hate on this generation for using screens and previous generations didn't use screens, but you know that those previous generations would have used screens if they had the option because parenting is difficult and it can drive you nuts some days and everyone needs a cooler. <laughs> I think the most important point is that we need to be informed about the reality of screens and TV and shows and that the educational aspect of it isn't actually good for your children, but we don't need to always be doing everything perfectly good for ourselves and our children. We need to do what works best for ourselves and our family, and sometimes screen time is the answer for that. But try and be particular about what shows you choose. In this podcast I mentioned, it was really good about sharing what type of shows are good and what are not so good. Um, the baseline example is Mr. Rogers, which I thought was so funny because looking back on that show, it is so slow paced, it's soft voices, it's for the most part real humans, um, no bright colors, it just replicates real life. It's not like shouting at you for 25 minutes straight or whatever. I'm sure you can find other examples of shows online that are hopefully better when you do need to use that screen time tool, but it's very unrealistic to just say we're never gonna use screens ever. I think, anyways. I'm sure some people can do it, but not everyone. So, yeah, like I said, screen time had a lot more to it than I originally thought. Again, this is supposed to be an open conversation, so please tell me in the comments your thoughts, your mindsets, anything I left out, anything I said wrong. A lot of you liked to tell me what I said wrong last time, and that is fine. <laughs> I'm not claiming to know it all, I'm just trying to get a conversation going and to help everyone out. Yeah, okay, that's all. Yeah, I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.